So it's great to be back in Georgia. I, I really enjoyed uh, my visit here. Uh, I, 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 I don't know if I've ever thanked Matt, but Matt is responsible for me speaking to the largest audience I ever spoke in front of, which was in 2009, a million people with the Capitol in my back, you know, to the back and the Washington Mon Monument in front. Wow. I mean, that was uh, pretty impressive. It was two minutes. But, um, but just to give you an example, I think of some of what Matt has talked about, but what, what emotions could do or, or the power of even a two minute speech, not to praise myself, but this is, it's a good, too good of a story not to tell. About four years later, I had a young girl come to me at the Institute, at the Admin Institute. She was an intern. And she came up to me and she said, four years ago, you changed my life. And I said, what are you talking about? I, I never met you. You know, how did I change your life? She said I was 13 years old. And I was in that audience of a million people when you came on stage. And, then, and the speeches for a 13-year-old girl, most of the speeches were, you know, they were interesting, but they were conventional, a little dumb. And she said, I don't remember everything you said that day, but you said one thing that stuck in my mind. And I took home. And I remember saying it because I said it twice. And the audience was very uncomfortable with what I said. And it was a million people being very uncomfortable about what I said. So I felt a little uncomfortable. I said, you are not your brother's keeper. This is the tea party, which is quite Christian. So I said, you're not your brother's keeper. And I said it more than once. And I said, when you understand what that actually means, that you are not your brother's keeper. You know what your brother's keeper is? You, your moral responsibility, your duty in life is to take care of your brother. And who's your brother? Who's your brother? Everybody. Everybody. Not your real brother. That would be trivial. But the whole idea is you're responsible for everybody. And she said, nobody had ever said anything like that to me. That was striking. I'd never heard anything like it. And she went home and she thought about it. And she Googled me. And then she discovered, of course, Iron Man. She read Iron Man. She got a whole family to read Iron Man. Changed her life. So sometimes you never know how you're going to change your life. Uh, I, I learned from Matt's uh, talk just now that I am indeed a little older. Um, because uh, we both discovered Iron Man in the same year. We both discovered Iron Man in 1977. Matt discovered it because of Rush, and a lot of my friends discovered Iron Man because of this rock group named Rush. In 1977, I had no clue that Rush existed. Uh, they never made it big in Israel when I grew up. I discovered it because somebody handed me a copy of Atlas Shrugged. And at the time when I got Atlas Shrugged, I was a socialist, a committed socialist. I really believed in it. I was a huge critic of what I saw as capitalism in America. I was a collectivist. I was a tribalist. I was willing to lay my life down for the state, in this case Israel, for the tribe, the Jewish people. I had bought into all of it. I was 16 years old. You were 13 and 77, I take it. So I was 16 years old and committed to these causes and suddenly I get slapped in the face by Alice Shrugged. And I argued with Alice Shrugged. Because you can tell during the story that everything she's leading you towards is against everything I believed in. And I argued with it. I threw the book against the wall and I would yell at Ayn Rand. Luckily, she wasn't around to hear me. And by the end of the book, I was convinced. But Pat has asked me to talk about are the Iron Man characters in the world around us? And I think this is connected to, to, to what Matt was saying. Yes, I think there are elements of Iron Man's characters and a lot of people in the world around us. Hopefully, there are people in this room who are becoming or could be an Iron Man character in, an essential, in essential terms. I think it's in all of us to be an Iron Man character. But I think it's the importance of having those characters. 
having a story that illustrates a way of living and a way of carrying oneself, a way of projecting one's own values onto the world, a way of dealing with conflict and struggle is so crucially important. It's how people's minds, I think, are changed. Stories are incredibly valuable because they go deep into our soul. They shape, they can help shape who we are. And to have heroes, to have heroes is so very important. I mean, religion knows this, right? Religion is a story with heroes. You can agree with the heroes, you can disagree with the heroes, but they're heroes. Religion understands, and I think most ideologies understand, the power of art, the power of projecting an ideal before all of us, to live up to that idea. So again, I encourage you to read Ayn Rand, to read Atlas Shrugged, to read The Fountain, and to read Anthem, which is a very short, short book, which will be in your language very shortly. To read We the Living, which I think your parents experience what it was like living under communism. We the Living is a book about living under communism and the implications of that and what it does to the human soul, not necessarily, it deals with it, not necessarily what it does to the economy, but what it does to the individual. Because at the end of the day, to change the world, to, to, to bring about the kind of society we all want, the first thing we have to change is ourselves. We have to be able to live up to such a society. Because what does capitalism or freedom require of individuals? It requires them to take responsibility for their own lives. It requires them to be able to stand on their own two feet, to live as individuals. It requires that we abandon any entitlement that we feel that the world owes us something, that the universe owes us stuff. No. Our job in the world as individuals who are left free is to create and build for ourselves, to make our life and the life of those we love and the, love of, uh, the lives of those we care about the best that they can be. But to do that, we have to be confident we can actually live that kind of life. We have to be confident in our own abilities. And when you're young and you don't know exactly, it's often incredibly valuable to have role models to have heroes that you can strive to become. Because we're all capable of it, I believe, and I think this is one of the differences between us and the left and the right, so parts of the right, is that we believe, I think, that every individual is capable of taking care of himself. That the, the small minority of people, because of some ailment or some disease or some birth defect who cannot take care of themselves, truly take care of themselves. It's tiny. It's, you know, and, and I always ask questions, people always say, well, what about those who can't take care of themselves? Well, okay, how many people are willing to put a little money aside to help take care of those who can't take care of themselves? The tiny minority, less than a percent, who can't do it. Every hand in every room goes up. I say, well, there you go, we get together and we'll take care of them. What's the problem? There's no issue here. The issue is, can you take care of you? The left, and a lot of people, elitists, as they often are called today, although I think that's a, that's a bad concept, think that you can't take care of yourself. That individuals can't live a good life by themselves, for themselves. They think that we need to take care of everybody to some extent. Today in America, almost 50% of all Americans get stuff from the government. Do they need it? No. But they're told over and over again, oh, no, no, you can't survive without us protecting you, taking care of you, watching over you. you know, don't drink that soda, it'll make you fat. You can't make that decision for yourself. God forbid. We, the philosopher kings, we know what's good for you. So before I think we preach capitalism and freedom, 
we have to convince ourselves that we can take care of ourselves, that we can make the right decisions for ourselves. That we'll fail, everybody fails, but that we are capable of failing and then standing back up and doing better the next time. So it's self-improvement. Self-improvement has to be the beginning. Self-education and ultimately self-confidence that comes from all of that. The self-esteem. To have a sense that my life belongs to me and I can live it. And I don't care what your IQ is. I know there's a lot of debate these days about IQs. I don't care what your IQ is. I mean, below a certain point, maybe it's impossible, but most people, 99% of people, can achieve that. They can take care of themselves. They won't all be Bill Gates. I won't be Bill Gates, ever. I won't be that rich, but I don't want to be that rich. Not what I do. I love this more than I love money. I could have gone to Wall Street, but this is so much more fun than looking at spreadsheets, spreadsheets, right? Looking at spreadsheets, this is fun. But all of us can have a sense of achievement. All of us have a sense of doing something with our lives, of making something with our lives. And if people have that sense, if we can help people gain the confidence, the self-esteem, that they are capable of living and the focus on making their lives as individuals the best life that they can live, then what kind of world do people who want to live I want to embrace life, I want to enjoy life, I want to make the most of their own life. What kind of world do they want to live? A world in which Mother Government sits on their shoulder and tells them, don't drink that, it's not good for you. Don't start that business. Oh, you can't pay your employees that amount. We have to tell you how much to pay your employees. Or you can't use that product, you can't consume that. Do we really? Individualists who really believe in themselves? They're not going to tolerate that. They're not going to tolerate it. Every time I go through, you know, in America, we have the TSA. We have this uh, agency responsible for security in our airports. So you have to go through, just like here, but they're, they're all more obnoxious than pretty much anyway. And you have to go through these metal detectors. You have to take all your stuff out of your pockets. You have to take your shoes off. And then if, if something beeps, then they frisk you, right? And, and you get it all over Europe, right? And I think to myself, what would happen if George Washington was going to walk through here? I don't know how much you know about George Washington. George Washington was like his own guy, right? Tall, you know, somebody who had the full confidence. You know, he's going to frisk George Washington, right? That sword would have come out and you don't touch me. And I think people who have self-esteem, people who respect themselves, people who know who they are, they're not getting the state to come and frisk them. They're going to let the state determine you know, every little aspect of their life. Yeah, the state has a role to protect us, to protect our you know, individual rights, the police, our military, right? Judiciary, we don't want to go walk around and do duels in the middle of the street. But other than that, I can live my life. I don't need all these state mechanisms. I don't need them to tell me what healthcare procedure I can and cannot do, what drugs I can and cannot take, legal or illegal. It's not a big business. That's what some confident people think. So a lot of a lot of our discussions are about the self-esteem that people have. Again, how many people have read one of Ayn Rand's novels? Not a lot. All right. Okay, a few are too shy to raise their hands. So better than I thought. All right. I really encourage you to read the books, not because of the politics, not because of the critique of statism but because of the heroes. The way they think, the way they approach the world, the way they approach their own life. They take their own life seriously. Their life is their responsibility. We talk about personal responsibility, but at the end of the day, the most important thing in terms of personal responsibility 
is taking this, your mind, your soul, as important, as something to be cultivated, as something to be cherished, as something to be worked on. Your life is something you have, you have one, one, one of these. No second chances. I don't believe in reincarnations. And even if you do believe in reincarnations, you might come back as a cockroach. <laughs> so you want to make you want to make good use of this one life that you actually have. Iron Man's heroes do exactly that. Whether they're living under communism, like in We the Living, the heroine of We the Living, Kira, is trying to live the best life she can for herself, trying to make herself the best that she can be in a tragic, horrible, evil environment. She never, ever gives up to the last words in the book. In the fountainhead, the hero is Howard Rock, an architect who has a vision for what buildings should look like, has a vision for what he believes homes and, and office buildings and museums and temples even should look like. And he won't compromise. It's not that he'll force his design on you, just he won't take your money if you're not going to accept his design. Because he has integrity, artistic integrity. He will not compromise. Even, even, and this is this is strange for people who superficially know about Iron Man, even if it means he won't get paid, even if it means he has to go work with his hands and lose his business, he won't compromise. At some point in the novel, he goes to work in a quarry, you know, chopping stones because he would, you know, the client wants to make changes to his design, changes that will change the integrity of the building and he won't compromise. And you read that and we all think about the little compromises we have to make in life or we choose to make in life. And we think about the little decisions that we have and we're not about to have to go to the quarry if we don't. And it gives you that spiritual fuel that helps be a little braver. Be a little stronger, be a little bit more principled. In Alice Shrugged, the most political of Iron Man's novels, and I'm not going to give the story away, but in Alice Shrugged is an ode. It's an ode to businessmen. It shows the productive genius that is required to be a successful businessman. The kind of effort, the kind of work, the kind of struggle and the kind of thinking that has to go into creating a business and creating wealth. No book in all of human history, since or before, has been so pro-business, pro, so pro the entrepreneur, achievers. And if I think today of characters from my man's books, again, I think, all, it's in all of us, and there are a lot of people in terms of names and a novel. I mean, I think of the prominent businessmen that work today that are consistent. God, they have some bad ideas. But they're productive geniuses. Think about a Steve Jobs. I always use my iPhone, so here it comes. Right? Having a vision for something beautiful and not compromising. If you've read anything about Steve Jobs, you know, no compromise went into this. They had to go back and back and back to the drawing board until it was done the right way, the beautiful way, the effective way, the efficient way. How many focus groups? Everybody know? Probably study marketing, supposed to do focus groups, just to get the opinion of the customers because the customer is always right. How many focus groups? Zero. Steve Jobs never asked the customer what he wanted because Steve Jobs understood that real productive genius is about teaching us what we want, not about asking us what we want. Because if he'd asked me, I would have never come up with this. I would have said, don't waste your time. This is stupid. That's why I'm not a good venture capitalist. Productive geniuses, and this is a basic kind of law in economics, supply creates its own demand. If you produce something that is of value, people will come. If you build it, they will come. Also, a line from a movie. But he understood 
He understood the integrity of the product. He understood what we wanted better than what we did. Now, was Steve Jobs consistent throughout his life? Unfortunately, law, if he had been, he probably would still be alive today. So it killed him as inconsistencies. But in his productive life at Apple, in building that company, and failing and being fired from the company and being rehired, he lived a heroic life. When the day comes, I've always said when the day comes, when we're building statues out there for Steve Jobs instead of for politicians and generals and whatever, that's the day we're winning. When we gain an appreciation for the value that the great geniuses of production make to our lives, the Jobses, the Gates, the, the Bezoses of the world, put aside their politics, but how do they affect our lives? How did they change our world? When we gain that kind of appreciation, that's when the world is ready, really, to be free. Because the world we live in today resents those people. It likes to knock them down. It likes to see them broken. Everybody today is going after big tech watch because it was so successful. How did it get successful? How do you become successful in business? Even in America still today, how do you get successful in business? Anybody? How do you become a billionaire? My favorite question to ask audiences. Because I've got the answer. How do you become a billionaire? What's that? Smart work. I know a lot of really smart people who do good work. They're not billionaires. Some special sauce, secret sauce, not a secret. Secret sauce of becoming a billionaire. What's the secret sauce of becoming a billionaire? Create something that is valuable to hundreds of millions of people. So valuable that they are willing to pay you more than it costs you to produce it. Which means what? What effect did it have on their lives if they were willing to pay you more than it cost you to produce it? What, if, what, what effect did it have on their lives? If I pay $1,000 for this, $1,000. This is the new one, right? <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean? How much is this worth to me? More than 1000 now, don't tell Apple, but it's worth a lot more than $1,000. A lot more. It changed my life. I can communicate with my family from anywhere in the world. I can do business 24-7 from anywhere in the world. I can do business far more efficiently than I could, and I still remember the days before email, than I could in those ancient days before the internet and email. This has completely changed my life. It's worth tens of thousands of dollars, if you can even put a number to it. So how do you become a billionaire? By making the lives of hundreds of millions of people better off. By providing them with a value that they are willing to pay for. More than what it costs you to produce, so you make a profit off of it. But if you can, you can even make a small profit. If you multiply by hundreds of millions of people, it's a big number. Think about Jeff Bezos. Think about how he changed the way we shop. I don't know about Georgia yet. Amazon and Georgia? <coughs> I now live in Puerto Rico. I couldn't survive without Amazon. Not, not enough choices in Puerto Rico. But, I mean, it's amazing. We take it for granted. You get your generation doesn't even know what shopping really is like. Right? Or banking. Or any of these things because some entrepreneur figured it out and solved and made our lives dramatically better dramatically better and it's not like he did it for us it's not like he did focus groups it's not like he cares particularly about me or you or any one of us they don't know who we are and they literally don't I don't think Jeff Bezos cares one iota about me or you he doesn't what does Jeff Bezos mainly care about? Well, it turns out going to Mars. He wants to go to Mars. He's accumulating lots of money. He cares about himself. He cares about his family. He cares about the people that he cares about. Not about his customers. 
His customers are there because the customers. So what we need in life are great models like that. I mean, I admire Jeff Bezos. I admire Steve Jobs. I admire these guys. Any startup entrepreneur who, who takes massive risks and builds something and places all his energy in his effort into producing and creating and building for himself. And again, I, this is true of entrepreneurs, but this is true of a good engineer, this is true of a good writer, this is true of whatever it is that you do in life. If you really put yourself into it, if you really engage, if you are committed to integrity, if you're committed to the virtues that are going to make your life a successful, then you are, or can be, an I met hero. But it's great to have those models so we know what to strive towards. And being successful in life is hard. Being successful in life takes effort. And what Ayn Rand's ideas, what Ayn Rand's philosophy does, and again, I'm going to put aside all the politics, is it gives you tools to be effective at making your life better, at making your life the best that it can be. Channels you into the right values and the right virtues that can enhance your life, can make you a hero in this world, a hero to the only person who counts, you. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Yep. Uh, I don't want to ask a question about the new people who are going to be a spider-man and the most famous and the most So this is a question about Steve Ditko, uh, the famous cartoonist who was one of the uh, creators of Spider-Man together with Stan Lee, both, both recently died. Uh, Steve Ditko first and, and Stan Lee recently. Uh, again, an, an example of somebody who took their ideas and made cartoons or made art with them to inspire people. And, and that's why he's maybe the most famous objectivist, although he, he probably competes with a former objectivist by the name of Alan Greenspan, who, who betrayed objectivism dramatically at some point. But um, you know, I don't know much about Steve Ditko. I, I, you know, he was a he was a strange person. He was a recluse. He didn't uh, he didn't engage with other people. People try to communicate with him. I know. I I wrote him letters. I tried to communicate with him. Wrote him emails. Nothing. He he, he gave no response. I mean, I, I think his Mr. A cartoons. Again, I'm not an expert on on uh, on, uh, but I think they were a little. I don't know. Um, they weren't incredibly successful, obviously, right? They didn't, they, they, you know, and, and, and you can be successful writing objectivism. <laughs> I mean, right? So I mean, it's not also incredibly successful. They, they, they sell as many copies today as when she was alive. She's probably the only author where that is true who has not required reading in high school. So the other authors that sell as many books now as they were alive is because they were required in high schools. <laughs> Almost nobody requires Ayn Rand in high schools, right? Nobody. She's a she's a persona non grata in many high schools, although we, we've changed that in the last few years pretty significantly. So I, you know, I think when it came to his objectivism, he wasn't very good at turning the objectivism into productive art. He seemed to be better when he wasn't oriented towards now I'm an objectivist, like when he did Spider Man. Spider Man's not an explicitly objectivist <laughs> theme. It's it's a it's a it's a just a superhero, and he's very successful in that. I think it's very hard. It's very hard. That's why, it, you know, Matt's project of creating stories is so powerful. But it's hard to create stories, good stories, good stories, particularly if they have a philosophical theme. It's not easy to do, and it takes real work, and it takes uh, you know real artistic ability. And I think very few people I know 
have managed to do with objectivism, with the, philo the philosophy of objectivism post Iron Man. A lot of people have tried, usually it's garbage because it's, it's difficult. So it's hard to make art and then it's really, 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 really hard to make art with meaning, with, with, with a philosophy and a particular philosophy. You know, Rush is, is, a, is an exception. They were one of the, one of the, you know, one of the groups, one of the individuals who succeeded in doing that, in taking an abstract idea and applying it in what in and out. Questions about anything related to Iron Man, objectivism, it's quite good. George has used the more. So, uh, I heard you say that you're not okay with what people do. I what? <coughs> people do in the streets. They yes. Not pay for you. But uh, why not? Well, if two people are okay with that, they sign the contract. And if it gets broadcasted, it will be like the English would all say. If the streets is like primed and the owner is not so okay with that, then why should there be anyone to pay with that? <laughs> I, I sigh because anarcho-capitalists are everywhere. Um, I don't think all contracts are legitimate. They are both adults. I don't care. I don't think all contracts are legitimate even between adults. I don't think every choice you make as an adult is contractable. Contracts are meant for specific purposes and things, there are all kinds of, and I'm not an expert on this, but, but legal philosophy, there are certain contracts are real contracts. They, for example, have to expire, and they have both parties have to have a benefit to it, an objective benefit to it. There are all kinds of ways in which you can say, this is a legitimate contract, this is an illegitimate contract. And the, and the courts, I think rationally, have over many years said they are illegitimate contracts. They're contracts that we cannot fulfill because they, they don't abide by the basic premises of a contract. And I think one of those, one of those, is that a contract has to involve a basically a win-win situation, an objectively win-win situation, not a whim-based win-win situation. And if it doesn't, if one party is clearly objectively losing, then it's not a contract. Now, even if they choose to lose, you have a right to commit suicide. You have a right to commit suicide. What you don't have a right is to create a spectacle in the middle of, of a street, right? With, you know, so yeah, you can have the duel on private property. It won't be a contract. You can have a duel, and the person who shot you is going to have to prove to a judge and a court and a legal system that he that it was okay, okay in quotes, for him to shoot you. The burden of proof is still going to be on him. So, you know, I don't think you can contract yourself into slavery. I don't think you can contract yourself into stuff that is clearly, objectively, by the standard of human life, bad for you. That, and shoot yourself. Don't, don't create a spectacle about it. There's something, there's something perverse. And by the way, dueling is not about I have cancer. Dueling is about we disagree. And the way we resolve our disagreement is by going into the street and having a sword fight or a gun fight. That is one of the great achievements of civilization is that we don't do that anymore. What's that? Lots of people die during boxing and they get hit into You know, I'm not, a, I'm not a, that because it's not explicitly about death, the same in football. I don't like boxing. I've never liked boxing. I don't like football anymore. My, my like for football has gone down as it's become evident that the real the damage to the brain is real and these people are really on the field committing slow suicide. I don't watch it anymore. But there's a big difference between having a football game where you're bashing each other, you're not actually dying, and between taking guns into the street and shooting one another. Not to, and, and legitimizing that. Once you legitimize that, then that happens more and more frequently. That is not a kind of civilization I think anybody should want to live in. And I think, I think that's what anarchy results in. It results in constant shooting in the streets. It's not good for anybody. And ultimately, who benefits from a society in which everybody's shooting? The guy with the biggest gun, who ultimately takes control and, 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 and runs this bit. But we can get into, a, you know, I just did in Poland, of all places. Well, Poland and alcohol caps are big. So I did a big a debate in Poland on alcohol capitalism. You can go watch it online. Uh, you know, there are many, many, many arguments against it. I don't know of any good ones for it. So, Marlon? I said about anything. 
Quiet. Have you ever thought about dueling to the finish to solve this argument? <laughs> well, I think I have. It's solved. <laughs> I, you know, I since I don't believe in violence, uh, to the finish is not is not. The, but I, 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 you know, I don't think. I mean, it's. It, I, I don't think there's a there's a connected to reality, uh, rational argument for. Uh, for anarchy, and I, I consider anarcho-capitalism contradiction in terms because I think uh, a, a requirement of capitalism is government. You cannot have a functioning marketplace without a uh, monopoly over the use of retaliatory force that has objective laws in place. I, you know, I know I have a lot of opponents uh, on this issue. There are yeah. two more questions. If economics are so important in our lives. Uh, why are not we implementing it in schools uh, to teach our kids? So why aren't we teaching kids economics in school, if given that it's so important in our lives? Well, I, I think uh, one thing I would say is I'm glad we're not teaching it in schools because what's being taught today is so bad, even at universities, that at least we're not corrupting the kids a little, even more. But I, I think the real reason is that the powers to be don't want you to know economics. Uh, public schools, government, government runs the schools, and the government would rather you stay ignorant of economics. The more economics you know, the more you will realize how destructive government policy is, how stupid government policy is, uh, and how what really motivates much of government policy is powerless, not economics. So to the extent that good economics are taught in schools, it would undercut government policy. The government is not going to teach you stuff that undercuts their own, uh, their own power. In private schools, in many private schools, you do have classes in economics, you have classes in philosophy, you have a much more variety. And I think in a, in a market where you actually had a market in schooling, there'd be a competitive advantage in teaching good economics in high school and, and, uh, and schools will teach it. Uh, what I don't understand is that um, on one hand we say that you are against violence and you don't believe that individuals uh, should uh, like, take care of just because of and are uh, very for that. But on the other hand, you are for uh, gun. Uh, 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 regulation of guns? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Why are they getting me in trouble here? I mean, all the topics where I get harassed on. I believe government is a necessary good. And the government's responsibility is um, to be the monopoly over the use of retaliatory force. It is not your responsibility to chase down the criminal and to shoot them in that case. It's also not your responsibility to, to run farm policy or to, you know, in a sense, to to involve yourself in, um, in wars or, or stuff like that. That is the one thing that's being delegated to the government is um, the protection of individual rights, which means the police and the military. Also. So I find with individuals owning guns for their own self-defense in an emergency. Somebody based in my house, I don't have time to call the police. I've got a gun, I shoot the best. I'm cool with that, right? Somebody's violating my rights, they have forfeited their own, and I'm fine with that. But that doesn't involve having in my home 75 AK-47s, and a big, one of those real machine guns, and maybe a tank in my backyard. Defending myself in a civilized country, now in uncivilized countries, you know, you need a tank maybe, but in civilized countries, you don't need that. You need a shotgun. It's probably the best self-defense weapon there is because you don't have to aim very closely. A handgun, you know, maybe one semi-automatic weapon, but you need something for the self-defense, but that's it. So I think that beyond that, it's out, it, it, it becomes offensive, offensive in terms of offense, in terms of use of force. And it's not defense. And therefore, I think the government has an appropriate role in its role as being the monopoly over the use of force in regulating what you have in your home. Look, I, I, you know, I've shot a lot of these guns, right? I was in the Israeli army, I was in a tank. 
blew up stuff and, and I mean it's fun right it's fun but the only legitimate purpose of a gun the only legitimate purpose of a gun is to kill that's why we like it it's why we have it now I know hunters and sportsmen that's all fine but they, at the end of the day the reason they designed the guns that the way the reason that Glock is the way it is the reason it, it sits in your hand the way it is is to kill somebody if you have to kill somebody fine in an emergency that's what you have to do but but to allow people to own weapon to own stuff whose only purpose is killing people a tank the only purpose is to blow stuff up um i think it's wrong i think it's wrong but how can you i think it's uncivilized and i wouldn't want to live in a place where my neighbor had 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 all these weapons and i didn't know how he was going to use it tomorrow and i would i would feel like Okay, if they have big weapons, I better get some big weapons because who knows when they're going to turn their weapons on me. And you get this internal arms race, which is, it's, it's not. So what if your neighbor is a karate expert? Then I have a handgun. You ever see that movie uh, where he goes like this, ah, I'm going to get you, and the guy pulls out a gun and says, <laughs> I can't remember the movie, but there was literally a movie like that where he said, no. I don't care about your karate. This is, and this is with the power of a gun. The power, a, a gun is incredibly powerful. Thing. It's incredibly, and it, and it gives you a sense of power when you're holding a gun, right? It's, it's an incredibly powerful thing, and that's why I think it needs to be controlled. It's the only thing. Yeah. And the last question. You mentioned that force. Yeah. That's right. There are a lot of problems. <laughs> so it's hard to do government right. Very hard to do government right. And Ayn Rand argued, I agree with her, that to do government right, you must have the population must have the right philosophy. They they have to have the right set of ideas. Even if we get government right, like I think the founders of America got it as about as right as anybody got it. I would have made a few improvements, but generally they got it right. You still have to be vigilant to make sure that the government stays right, stays on course. It's ours. I mean, in that sense, we are the government, right? And if we don't believe in that kind of government anymore, we won't have that government. Anymore. And if you track the U.S. If you look at the, 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 the deterioration in the quality of government in the U.S., it tracks completely the deterioration in the understanding of liberty and the understanding of freedom among the American population. And that's true of any system. Any system that the people don't believe in anymore will ultimately collapse. People have to believe in it, otherwise it won't work. I don't care what system you come up with. It will ultimately depend on people actually wanting it. At some point in America, the intellectuals turned against the system, and when the intellectuals turn against the system and write good books and uh, articulate the case for bigger and bigger and bigger government, which is what happened in the late 19th century, early 20th century in America, we got it because the people changed. But just because there's never been that kind of government doesn't mean it can't exist. Okay, maybe last short question, short answer. I don't have short answers. Psychological. Psychological. Why people think about the idea that actually Canada's work in history? Why people refer to socialism and why people refer to socialism? I think it's not. Okay, so he said a short question, so let me just take it, right? Socialism doesn't work. We all know this. History suggests it. Every example in the book shows it. Every time people say socialism, it leads to death and starvation. That's it. I mean, that's unequivocal. There's no counter example of socialism actually working to enrich human life. None. So why do people keep coming back to socialism? Because the socialists, in a sense, tell a better story. Why do they tell a better story? In my, in my man's view, in my view, right, the culture we live in today, the moral code, the foundation of the culture, 
is a morality that's consistent with socialism. So even though socialism feels, socialism feels right, and it feels right because our morality tells us it's right. What does our morality say? You should live for other people. Socialism does that. It requires you to live for the others. It's each according to, from each according to his ability, to each according to his needs. If somebody needs, it's your moral responsibility to help them. Our moral code says socialism executes on it. Socialism says, our morality says, if you have more than the other kids, you should share. Sharing is caring. Sharing is good. Well, socialism does that. If you have a little bit more, it helps you share with everybody else. It, our morality tells us that virtue is about being selfless. Socialism encourages you to be selfless. We are told that the most noble thing you can do in life is to sacrifice. Socialism is brilliant at sacrificing. Tens of millions of people sometimes have to die for the good of the cause. So on what basis do we say socialism is bad? We sacrifice. We share. We don't live for ourselves. So the stories that they tell, they tug at our heartstrings. Why? Because our heartstrings are being conditioned by a morality that is wrong. The only way to fight socialism is to replace that morality. It's to change what tugs at our heartstrings. Because the socialist story is more consistent with those premises. And Ayn Rand challenges that. She's the only thinker that challenges that. She says, no, your purpose in life is not to live for other people. Your purpose in life is to live for yourself and make your life the best life that it can be. No, you shouldn't sacrifice for other people. You train with other people. You engage with other people in mutually beneficial transactions. Win-win. The purpose in life is to maximize win-win transactions. Not win-lose, not lose-lose. Your purpose, so at every one of these questions, I, I mean, when, it, when my kid was playing in the playground and somebody wanted their toy, I didn't automatically say, you gotta share. Figure out how to trade. Then the kid probably has something that you want, trade. We, we need to change the way we approach the world. This is why it's so hard. This is why I think the case for free markets is so hard. Because encoded in our moral DNA, it's not really DNA because it's not biologically encoded, but encoded in our morality and our ethics and the way we think about the world is this philosophy of sacrifice and collectivism and the nobility of others over our own life. And until that changes, it's going to continue to be a really big struggle. But what we need is not an economic and political revolution. What we need is a moral revolution. If you have the moral revolution, if people start caring about their own lives, about living the best life that they can live for themselves, then the political economic revolution, I think, is easy for the reason I said before. Right? No person with self-esteem actually wants to be told what they can and cannot do, how to do it, when to do it, what to do. They want to be left free to go and produce and, and, and make their lives the best life. Thank you all.